in the book of Acts, if you will. I want you to say this verse with me. And some of you are going to say, Rob, I've seen this before. Good. I hope so. I hope this is getting ingrained in your minds today. Let's say Acts 1-8 out loud together. I'll get you started, then I'm going to quit and let you carry it, okay? Here we go. But you will receive power... Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And of course, that is the outline for the entire book of Acts. And today, or actually last Sunday, we kind of dipped our toe into chapter 13, a verse and a half, as we begin the last section of the book of Acts, which is the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, last Sunday, as we began this last section, we took a closer look at the, at the church in the city of Antioch, or what I sometimes refer to as Antioch Community Church. And they were a great church. We saw from chapter 11 last Sunday that they're really a model church. Any church today that wants to be a church that honors God and does what he wants them to do, I believe should model themselves after the church in Antioch. We saw from chapter 11. It was great because lots of people came to faith in Christ, and that always builds excitement in a church. They possessed a commitment to the Word of God. Uh, they, they were under the teaching and the preaching of the Word. They applied it to their lives. They were growing in their faith, and that's what God's Word does in our lives. We saw that they were a great church because they had a heart for other people, and they expressed that heart in tangible ways. They took up an offering for people in Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, they had a profound impact on their city, and today Today we're going to see that they, they're going to have a prof profound impact on the world as they sent out the very first missionaries to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now one of the things that also made the church of Antioch great was the fact that they had godly leaders. And that's what we saw in the first verse and a half of chapter 13. Would you look there and follow as I uh, read along please? In the, in the uh, local church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and uh, namely five, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Menian, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and of course Saul, later to be known as Paul. Now today we're going to examine, as we continue through chapter 13, the first leg of the first missionary journey ever undertaken. Now, we're to the point now uh, at which the church of Jesus Christ is taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, and on this first leg... Of the very first missionary journey, we're going to learn a truth that I think is so easy for us as followers of Jesus to either not recognize or to forget. And I don't want us to do that today because this is the emphasis of these first 12 verses. This is the emphasis, this very true reality, and it's this. We are engaged as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are engaged in an all-out war against hell. Amen? We are. We're engaged in an all-out war against hell. And guess what? These verses today are going to remind us of that. So let's ask God to help us to get what he wants us to get out of these verses here in Acts chapter 13 as we go in prayer. Heavenly Father, Acts is a history book. It tells us how your church started and how it expanded around the globe. And thank God it did. Thank God people like Saul and Barnabas and others went around the world starting churches and preaching the gospel. And those churches started churches. And those churches started churches. And those churches started churches. And the next generation started churches. And here we are today. Because of them, we stand on their shoulders today. And, and, and the next generation after us, here in Norwalk and beyond, are going to stand on our shoulders if we're faithful. If we're faithful. If we're faithful to remember and live by the truth that we are engaged in an all-out spiritual war against Satan and the forces of evil in the heavenly realms. God, I pray this morning that this reality will not escape us. In fact, tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, we'll live by it. We won't just believe it, but it'll impact the way that we live. Show us, God, how you want me to do that today. Show everyone here how you want them to do that today in response to your word. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you know, our congregation has adopted a nation in the world, on the other side of the world, that, that we are trying to impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the communist country of Laos. And we do, we do our best every year to organize a small trip, a short-term mission trip over to Laos. In fact, we have one going this fall. Uh, as far as I know, we've got seven of us who are going to be going on the trip. And when we go on that trip to the other side of the world, uh, the trip's going to be broken up into various legs. For example, we're going to leave. I don't, I don't know what the flight plan is yet, but in the past I've noticed that when you get on the airplane in Des Moines and you either fly to Chicago or Minneapolis... And then once you get on the plane there, that's the first leg. Then you get on the plane there and you fly across the Pacific and you usually land in Tokyo, or Japan, or Seoul, Korea. And that takes, you know, just flying across the Pacific Ocean takes like 11, 12, 13 hours. Then you have a layover there. Then you get on another plane and you fly from either Tokyo or Seoul to Bangkok. And that's another six, seven hours depending on where you're coming from. Then you got a layover there and you get another plane and you fly over to Vientiane into Laos or whatever. Usually that's where you're going to go or another place in Laos. And so it's leg after leg after leg. And in the same way, in, in fact, when you come back, you, you start in Vientiane and you go back to Bangkok and you go back to Tokyo and you go back to Minneapolis and you come back to Des Moines and you come back the very same way, the same legs. And it's in the same way here in the opening verses of Acts chapter 13 that Paul and Barnabas are being sent out on their very first missionary journey. A journey to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And on this journey itself, it's going to take them to many cities. Let me show you where this first missionary journey is going to take them. As we're going to see here in this section, it starts in Antioch. They're going to take, they're going to get on, uh, they're going to, uh, however they get to Seleucia, because Antioch's not on the coast, and so they go to Seleucia, they get on a boat, they go across the Mediterranean over the island of Cyprus, and, uh, in, and they're going to end up, and Derby, and when they get to Derby, uh, they're going to turn around and they're going to follow the same path all the way back to Antioch. So, as we come in the next few weeks, chapter 13 and chapter 14 of Acts is this journey. When you get to the end of 14, it's uh, Paul and Barnabas, and they're coming back to Antioch to report to the church what happened on this first missionary journey. Now, the opening verses here of chapter 13 explain how they ended up on that journey. And then we get to verses 4 through 12, we'll see the trip log. We'll see the blog, if you will, that Paul kept of what happened on this first missionary journey. Let's see how they got started, okay? Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. And again, as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. And then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them off. Now, uh, this is interesting what has happened here and, and uh, how they got on this first missionary journey. Uh, this, th there's something else that, that, that I'm being told here about the church in Antioch. Not only did it have godly leaders, okay, but this was a church that was guided by, could I go even further and say, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Did you notice here it says that they were fasting and praying, and while they were fasting and praying, it was the Holy Spirit who said, guys, set apart Saul and Barnabas. These guys were in tune with the Holy Spirit's leading for their lives, for their church. And I can show you other places down in, in, in verse 8. We'll get there in a little while. And it talks about Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw back several chapters ago, one of the leaders of the church is Barnabas. And we saw that Barnabas was known as a man to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, the church in Antioch was a church that was fueled by the Spirit of God. The church wasn't built on the bombastic preaching of the church leaders. The church wasn't built on the professionalism of the worship team. The church wasn't built on the impressiveness of their facility. In fact, to my knowledge, they didn't even have a facility to meet in. The church was not built on any other power source. The leaders of the church in Antioch and the people in the church in Antioch knew the meaning of Acts 1-8 when it says, and you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And truly, 
This is another important key to any church becoming a great church in the eyes of God. The members of the Antioch church sought to be under the guidance of under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means, and we've seen this. We've talked about this many places throughout the book of Acts. To be spirit-filled is to be under the control, not of self, not of the world, not of other people, but to be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. A a, a spirit-filled believer believes the words of Ephesians 5.18, where Paul says very clearly, don't be under the influence of alcohol, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. It goes in conjunction with Colossians chapter three, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so if I'm gonna be a person, a Christian, that's under the influence of the Spirit of God, I have got to be under the influence and the guidance and the obedience to the Word of God. If that makes sense, say amen. They go hand in hand. You can't dishonor the Word of God and be under the guidance of the Spirit. In fact, and if you're gonna be under the guidance of the Spirit, you will be seeking your best to know the Word and obey it in your life. And so this is a Spirit-filled church where people were living and talking and acting in the energy of the Spirit. Their hearts and minds were saturated with the Word of God. No wonder God used them to impact the world for Jesus Christ. No wonder he did. So in these verses, the leaders were fasting and they were praying. And God through the Holy Spirit, and I don't know how, but he told them to set apart Saul and Barnabas. And we're not told how. I I don't know if they were fasting and praying and uh, one of the other guys, his cell phone went off and it was the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you got a couple people there. I need you to separate them out, okay? I I don't know if that happened. I kind of highly doubt that happened. Uh, Put a smile on your face. I'm having fun, okay? Uh, I don't know if, if, if they just said, if they all gathered together and they said, guys, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'll tell you what I feel God wants God wants for us. I don't know if that's what happened. All I know is somehow they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit was saying, set apart. Actually, actually the words mean to tear off. Tear off Saul and Barnabas from the congregation at, so that you can send them out. The Holy Spirit had a special mission for them to perform. Now, before I move on to verse four, I think there's several spiritual principles that, I see in these, that we see in these verses that can help us. That, that maybe not all three of them, but maybe one of them could impact one of you today. Let's look at the first one. When God is looking for people to give a special assignment to, far as I can tell from the Bible, he's looking for people who are already busy serving him. God had a plan. The gospel needed to get to the ends of the earth. And who did God choose? The two busiest people in the church in Antioch. They had been there from the beginning. It had been over at least a year now that they had been busily teaching the people the word of God. God, the Holy Spirit, took the two busiest people in the church and said to the church, send these two guys out. I think when God has something that he wants to do, he's gonna look for people who are not only already busy serving him, but they're faithfully serving him people who are already busy because he can see that they have a heart for him. And it makes me ask the question then, are we busy? Am I busy? Are you busy serving the Lord? Are you actively engaged in ministry to people here in the body of Christ and beyond? Are you serving Jesus to the best of your ability? Because when God has a special assignment, he's going to looking for somebody like you to give a special assignment to because you've already proven faithful. A second principle that we see here is this. Go to number two there if you would please. God's special assignments come straight from the top down, not from the bottom up, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean, okay, the church didn't choose Saul and Barnabas. They didn't have an elders meeting and say, okay, here's everybody take a straw, okay? Jesus said, get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Somebody's gotta go. All right, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna choose straws here. Short straw, the two short straws are heading out. Ready? Everybody look. Oh, Saul and Barnabas, looks like you're heading out to the remotest part of the world. They didn't do that. They didn't say, let's take a vote. Well, I vote Saul and Barnabas. No, they didn't do that. The church didn't send them out. Who sent them out on the first missionary journey? You tell me. 
God did through the Holy Spirit, exactly. The Holy Spirit, it came from the top down. The leaders or the church people didn't tell God what they were gonna do. God told them. In fact, they didn't even volunteer either. The leaders were fasting and in prayer. And it was during that time the Holy Spirit gave that call. Number three is that our job in the kingdom of God is not to tell God what we're going to do, but to obey and wait for his perfect timing. The church in Antioch didn't sit down and devise a strategic plan separate from God's leading to reach the nations for Christ. They waited They prayed, they kept the focus of the church on on, on the word of God, on spiritual growth in their faith, and they did what God revealed to them was his will in his timing for the evangelization of the world. And when that plan and when that timing became apparent, what did God do? I find this interesting. When, When God finally said, okay, guys, it's time to go, who did God choose? Saul and Barnabas, he chose their very best. And honestly, through the years, we've seen God do that right here. We've seen God take uh, growth group leaders. We've seen God take deacons, elders, pastors, staff members, faithful servants in this church, and send them beyond Norwalk to serve in other churches, to plant other churches, to head out to the mission field, to serve in other ministries. God always takes our best. God did that with them. And so we need to remember that our job in the kingdom of God is not to tell God what we're going to do. Let's be faithful. Let's be in prayer. Let's do what we know he wants us to do right now. And he'll reveal his perfect will in his perfect timing. So when the Holy Spirit said, okay, guys, set apart Paul and Barnabas, they set them apart, and we're told there in verse 3 that again they fasted and they prayed and they laid their hands on these two men. It was a sign of their confirmation. They had the confirmation, not only of the Spirit of God, they had the confirmation of the leaders of the church and the church itself. And we've had these very similar uh, services, if you will, right here on this stage where we've laid our hands on people and we have sent them out. We are confirming. We are agree with God's call on their life, we, we bless them in Jesus' name to go where God wants them to go. And then here in Acts 13, they sent them out. So Saul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, they packed their bags, they said goodbye to their loved ones, they said goodbye to their church family, and they went off on the first missionary journey. And I have a hunch that they took two things. Now, if I was, if I was got to thinking, if I was Paul and Barnabas, and I'm heading out, and I don't know when I'm coming back, that I don't know totally exactly where I'm going to go. And so this sort of this unknown trip, this, this how long I'm going to be, what am I going to need, I have a hunch they took two things with them. Okay, they got to carry their stuff, right? So they took a suitcase, all right? Because you got to carry your stuff in it. They're ready to go. It's to the ends of the earth or bust, right? I mean, that's what they're going to do. It's to the ends of the earth or bust. They took their suitcase. They got ready to go. And then I think the second thing they took was something like this, a journal. Or maybe a little bit more modern times, we might say a blog. I begin, Paul began writing down as they went through their journey, leg by leg by leg, what happened. And we have a record of the journal. We have a record of the blog today. You know what it's called? Guess. The book of Acts. The book of Acts is the blog that was taken, telling us what happened leg by leg on this first, and in fact, every missionary journey. And so look at verse five. They're being sent out. It says, uh, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed God's message in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. So look at the slide, if you would, behind me. Uh, Again, Antioch was about 100 miles or so inland. They had to get from Antioch to the coast to get on the ship. So that's why it says they went to Seleucia. They got on the boat. They sailed to Cyprus. And the first major population center on on the eastern side of the island was Salamis. That's where they started. And their strategy was this. It said right there. It said first they went to the Jewish synagogues. So 
in its simplest form, a Jewish synagogue was basically a local church for Jewish people, okay? It was a local church for Jewish people. And Paul and Barnabas were Jewish themselves. So it was a natural place to begin. They knew that in every synagogue, they would meet at the end of the week, and they would read, the, they would pull out, they would pull out the scrolls, and they would read the scriptures at the appointed times. And then, whenever they would have guests in the church service that day, the guests would be given an opportunity to speak. And we're going to see that happen over and over again as we continue in the book of Acts. And so they knew that. And so they would go to the Jewish synagogues, and when they get done reading the scrolls of the day, they would say, does anybody, we have some guests here, do you guys have a word of God? And so they used that to their advantage, and every time they went to these synagogues, they would stand up and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they started with Jewish people. And they went from synagogue to synagogue all the way across the island. They went all the way across the island. So go to the next slide, if you would, Chad. They, they started in Salamis on the, go back. Is there a slide that shows them going across? They don't have that slide. Okay. Uh, they went all the way across the island to the other side of the island. Look at verse 6 in your scriptures. Acts 13 and verse number 6. And it says this. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. So the map, oh there it is, right there. You can see there's Paphos on the western edge of Cyprus. So they went all the way through the island. They went all the way through. Every time there's a synagogue, they would stop and preach the gospel in the synagogue. Okay, so they, got, they went to the other side of the island to Paphos. And look what happens. They came to Paphos. They came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear God's message. But Elymas, the sorcerer, that's another name for Bar-Jesus, which is how his name is translated, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Okay, so here's Barnabas and Saul. They get to the other side of the island. They get to Paphos. Things have been going great. All the way across the island, there's no record of any opposition. There's no record of any problems until they get to the, the Roman center, the center of government for the island. That was Paphos. And when they got there, they met a man. They were confronted by a man named Bar-Jesus, also known as, known as Elymas. And, and, and he opposed the message that they were preaching. And what, this, what we see here is that whenever the church of Jesus Christ seeks to advance the kingdom of God, guys, listen, this is true. There is always going to be opposition from our enemy. Isn't that right? Amen? Because Satan doesn't like us treading where he has his kingdom. He doesn't like the light invading his darkness. And that's what Saul and Barnabas are doing. They're bringing the light onto the island of Paphos, and Satan doesn't like it. And so he let them get all the way across the island, and then he used one of his primary instruments on that island, a guy named Bar-Jesus. Bar and Bar-Jesus was not a nice guy. In fact, he was a sorcerer. In other words, he would... He would conjure up the dead. He, would, he was into sorcery and magic uh, and, and uh, everything that the, the scriptures says don't be a part of. That's what this man did. He was also a false prophet. He was an evil, satanic man who consulted demons. And interestingly enough, this bar Jesus was on the staff of the governor of the island. His name was Sergius Paulus. He was one of the uh, he was one of the consultants or the advisors to the top guy, the governor on the island. So he was in a position of influence. Now, what, we, what we're told here is that Sergius Paulus was no dummy, okay? He was a very intelligent man. He was a very curious man. And somehow, I don't know how, but somehow he heard about Paul and Barnabas and their message. And when he heard about this, he sent word to them and said, come Come, I want to talk to you. I, I could just imagine Paul and Barnabas at the end of the day, and they're in their hotel room over there in Paphos, and they're getting ready to, you know, head, head to sleep that night, and all of a sudden they hear a at the door. And they open the door, and here's this guy they don't know, and he's a messenger for the governor. And he says, hey, guys, uh, listen, the governor's been hearing about what you're doing, and, and uh, you know, he's heard this. The story you're telling about this guy that rose from the dead, now he's alive again. He's been hearing about that. He wants you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, to come to the governor's mansion and share this story with him. And Paul and Barnabas, first of all, they're like, 
Okay, yeah, 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 we'll be there. Okay, I right, close the door. And they turn and face each other, and they're like, Yahoo! Yeah, they start high-fiving. Fist, but can you believe this? We've come all the way across the island. Now the governor wants to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can only imagine, again, it doesn't say, Scripture doesn't say, I'm reading into this, I'm being clear about this, I'm reading into this, but I gotta believe that night they got on their knees before they went to sleep, and maybe half the night, maybe more, and they prayed and said, oh God, What an opportunity you've given us to share the gospel with the governor of the island of Paphos. If he could accept Christ, imagine the influence that he could have over this whole island. Oh God, would you have mercy and save Sergius Paulus? And so the next day, or whenever they went, they went to Sergius Paulus. And Bar-Jesus, on orders from Satan, didn't like that. He didn't like the message because he was from Satan, he was evil, and he did everything he could to get the governor not to listen. He did everything he could to discredit the message. He did everything he could to, to somehow distract from the message of the gospel that Paul and Barnabas were sharing. And so Satan wasn't going to let Paul and Barnabas just walk into the governor's mansion Give him the gospel that easy? Wasn't going to do that. And as he sicked bar Jesus on them, that evil man tried everything. And at this point, there was no question in Paul and Barnabas' minds that they were engaged in a battle. There was a spiritual warfare going on, and the stakes were high. What are the stakes in spiritual warfare? The stakes are the glory of the name of Jesus Christ first and foremost. Amen? That's what's at stake every time we share Jesus Christ. It's the name of Jesus, but what's also at stake is the souls of men, the eternal souls of men who, if they accept Jesus, are eternity bound in heaven. But if they reject Jesus... They suffer forever in hell. The souls of men are likewise at stake. All this was on the line. And so here's Paul and Barnabas. And all I have to say is, Paul and Barnabas, welcome to the war. Welcome to the war. The soul of Sergius, the the governor, and anyone he would influence in the future should he accept Christ was up for grabs. And Satan was not going to go out without a fight. Who would win this battle? The blog tells us. Verse 9, then Saul, also called Paul, here it is, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at the sorcerer, and he said, you son of the devil, full of all deceit and fraud, enemy of all righteousness, won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, he looks right at him, the Lord's hand is against you, You're going to be blind, and you will not see the sun for a time. And suddenly a mist and a darkness fell on him, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Paul knew the truth of 1 John 4, 4, when it says, Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Amen? Paul knew that. He knew that. Paul didn't skirt this opposition. He didn't uh, back down. He didn't hem haul around and somehow try to soften the message of the gospel in any way. Instead, he faced old Bar Jesus uh, face to face, head on. He spoke the truth that Bar Jesus was a son of the devil. He was a deceiver, a fraud, an enemy of righteousness, and perverter of the ways of God. And Bar Jesus had been responsible for leading many people into spiritual darkness and away from the truth of Jesus Christ, but now he was going to experience a little darkness of his own. God used Paul to do a miracle, and Bar-Jesus became at least temporarily blind. So, with Bar-Jesus out of the way, verse 12 tells us what happens. Then the proconsul, that's Sergius Paulus, seeing what happened, believed and was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody got saved. Can I get a praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. This governor got saved that day. He believed in Jesus and he was saved. But please, be sure to notice what the blog says here. How how this happened. He believed in Jesus. But what most astonished him the most, what brought him to the point where he was ready to follow Jesus the most, was not The miracle of Bar-Jesus being blinded. That's not what did it. 
What astonished Sergius the most was the message of the gospel, the gospel message that there is a God who loves us, who sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. He died on the cross as our substitute for eternal death. And then they buried him and he rose again and all who repent of their sin and turn to him and believe in him will have everlasting life. That's the gospel, amen? And that's the message that they heard that day. That's what got Sergius Paulus' attention the most. The centerpiece. It just blew his mind. It so impacted him that he turned to Jesus, lock, stock, and barrel. You've heard that saying before, right? Maybe you haven't. Lock, stock, and barrel. It's an old saying. It means he was all in. Sergius Paulus was all in. And by the way, that's the way Jesus wants you to be. If you're going to turn to Jesus, don't hold back. Don't add him to what you already have on your shelf of gods. Don't add him to all your other priorities. Surrender it all to Jesus. Let him be the Lord of your life. Amen? And that's exactly what he did. And I just want to notice here that this first leg of this missionary journey, the centerpiece of this first leg by Paul and Barnabas, wasn't the miracle of Bar Jesus being blinded. Look at verse 13. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga. So, okay, this, that's the start of the second leg, which we're not going to get to today. So, when they got on the ship in Paphos, and they're going to head to Perga. They're going to head back across the Mediterranean to the north to Perga, which we'll see next Sunday. Okay. I can imagine in my mind now. They get on the ship. I don't know how long it's going to take to travel from Paphos to Perga. At least a few days on the ship. Paul takes his suitcase and he's sitting on the ship. And he slaps on his first sticker. Sunny Cyprus. And as we follow the rest of this first missionary journey, they're going to be in Perga and Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derby. And when he gets there, he's going to put those stickers on a suitcase. That's just the first missionary journey. There's two more to go later in Acts. By the end of all those journeys, Paul's suitcase is going to be full. And as Paul begins to look at his suitcase one by one, city by city, the memories are going to start flooding to his mind. And in the days and years to come, those memories, many, are not going to be good memories. Yes, they're going to be filled with people like Sergius Paulus, who accepted Jesus as their Savior. But they're also going to include memories of being stoned and left for dead. They're going to include memories of being shipwrecked and beaten, and tortured, and imprisoned. We're going to see in the coming chapters as missionary journey unfolds after missionary journey that Paul and his companions will experience hunger, and loneliness, and destitution. This is just the first. The second thing that I think is Paul and Barnabas were sitting on the ship, having pulled out of Paphos Harbor, heading over to Perga. Paul pulled out his journal. He began to write down what happened in the island of Cyprus, their first leg. And I believe the emphasis was on the transforming power of God to save souls in spite of Satan's best efforts to keep people in his evil clutches. That's what I read in the blog in Acts chapter 13. The emphasis was not on the miracle that blinded bar Jesus. The emphasis is that Satan can do his darndest to try to stand in the way of God, but we have an all-powerful God, and his message is all-powerful. Amen? That's the message of the first log, of the first leg of this, of this trip. Paul and Barnabas were now in a war, and they knew that Satan is no match 
for the presence of Jesus, that Satan is no match for the power of the gospel, and Satan is no match for the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Is Satan powerful? Absolutely. Is he organized? Read the scriptures. You better believe he is. Does he have a lot of forces to oppose us? You bet. He bet. About one-third of the angels were kicked out of heaven when they, re- when they rebelled against God and followed Satan. Yes, Satan's got lots of forces, and he's very cunning, and he's very evil, and he's very strategic and he's very tricky he has all that going for him but I'm going to tell you something remember what Jesus said remember what he said in Matthew 28 go to that verse if you would that slide if you would Chad no not that one Matthew 28 slide keep going there we go Matthew 28 remember what Jesus said go make disciples of all nations Make disciples of all nations and always remember, I will be with you to the end of the age. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, your efforts to tell people about Jesus, Satan can try to stand against them, but he can't stand up and defeat Jesus because, or defeat you because Jesus is with you. Amen? He can't stand up against the presence of Jesus. And then Paul said in Romans, the gospel is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. Satan can't stand up against the power of the gospel. And remember Acts 1.8. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Satan can't stand against the presence of the Holy Spirit of God inside us. So remember this. Our, our, our orders from Jesus are to be his witnesses. Does that mean everybody we tell about Jesus is going to get saved? No, it does not. No, they don't. They don't. But what God is looking for is faithfulness. Am I going to be a faithful witness? I can be a faithful witness. I don't have to be afraid of the enemy. I don't have to be intimidated by anybody who represents the enemy like Bar Jesus did. I have the gospel of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, and the person of the Holy Spirit living inside me. I do, you do as a follower of Jesus. We have everything we need, don't we? We've got everything we need. That's the first leg. That's what happened. Many more legs to come. As I think about these verses and I think about uh, what it meant for them and what, what it might mean for us today. Several things come in my mind about living out my faith. First of all, I think we ought to be active. I think we ought to be active in living out our faith. So don't be afraid to share the gospel. Don't be afraid to share the gospel. You've got Jesus, you've got the gospel, and you've got the Holy Spirit. You don't need anybody or anything else. Engage in the act, outreach activities of this church. You've got an insert this morning. I believe it's an orange one that talks about what we're doing on July 4th, okay? Pull it out right now. Take a look at it, all right? We're gonna be, we're gonna, not only are we gonna have parade floats in the July 4th parade, but we're working with the Churches of the Acts Network to do some activities in the park after the parade. Be engaged, be involved. We have, a, we have a church that cares about our community. We love Norwalk, and we're doing things to try to build bridges to reach our community. Be a part of those things. Take a look at that insert today. Fill it out. Be a part of what's going on. Don't sit on the bench this summer. Don't have a spiritual summer slump in your life. Well, I'm going to be gone this week, and that's okay. No problem. I'll probably be gone a few weeks too. But don't, be, don't get in a summer slump in your life. Be a part. Be engaged. And next weekend... And next week in the, community, the Connection Music Festival, there's an insert in your worship folder about that. If you would like to be involved in that, simply fill that out. Drop it in the boxes on your way out today. Next week, we'll start talking about Fun Fest coming up the first week of August. And it's the largest children's ministry outreach that we have. And uh, so we'll tell you more about that starting next weekend. Be active. Number two, be informed. Be informed. Learn more about the missionaries that our church has sent out at the mission wall in the lobby. Learn more about Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, get on a couple of these websites or other websites that you might know and, and learn more about what they were doing. I can only cover so much in my brief time here on Sunday morning. And then for next weekend, continue reading. Be, read Acts 13, 13 to 52, and be ready to be mentally engaged as we continue looking at this first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13. And thirdly, be in prayer. Be in prayer. Pray for the sent ones, what we call MIFs, members in the field that our church has sent out. Pray for lost people. And so um, what I felt the Lord speaking in my heart about this was I have a spiritual journal almost exactly like this. And I have a page dedicated toward people I know that don't know Christ. And I hadn't uh, really updated that for a while. And, uh, and so I took the time to sit down and, 
And I got several people on this list here that I know that don't know Jesus Christ. And then I was reminded, you know what? I need to be more faithful praying for these people. And some of the people on my list are some of the people you know. A spouse, a friend that doesn't know Jesus. Some of you, I know those people in your life and I put them on my list. Maybe you know someone in the community. I have a few people that, that aren't connected to our church in any way, but they're in our community. They're on my list. If you have loved ones who don't know Christ, I certainly hope you're praying for their eternal soul. Let's get serious about praying for lost people and praying for those that we send out. We have four young people this morning that have recently graduated from high school and they're serving in Tijuana, Mexico. And guys, you know how hard that is? Remember when you graduated from high school like a couple years ago like me? You know, remember that? You know, five or ten years ago? And, uh, I mean, I mean, you had thoughts of college. You had thoughts of, we had thought, lots of thoughts. I got to tell you, I never, when I graduated from college, I, I never thought about giving a year of my life to serve in a ministry in a foreign country. It never even crossed my mind. Did it cross your mind? And yet we have four young people who not only did it cross their minds, they've committed themselves to doing that. Have you ever tried to live in a foreign culture, in a foreign country that doesn't speak your language, that's what they're doing. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for Josh and his brother Trevor Pinnico. We need to pray for Ashley Lawton. And we need to pray, who's the fourth one? Thank you, uh, Jake Buckles. We need to keep these four in prayer. Because they're over there and they're serving God. And it's hard. And I know, okay, Tijuana, Mexico is just across the border. I know that. I know all that. But they're out, of the, they're out of their comfort zones. They're away from their families. And they're in a foreign culture. And beyond that, they're working for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I'd like us to, I can't think of any, anything better to do to close this service out than pray for them. And so I'm going to ask the worship team to come and get ready for this closing song. And let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we uh, close this service today, we do want to thank you for those that you have called out of this church. And uh, there are many right now who are serving. But today, God, our focus and our minds go to those that are in Mexico, our young people, our four young people. Father, I thank you for Jake. I thank you for Ashley. I thank you for Trevor and Josh. And Father, um, I know that this starting tomorrow, they're going to have a lot of people coming into where they are to build houses this week. And Father, I pray for their safety. Every day they're going to get on top of these houses and teach others how to build. Father, I pray that you keep them free from accidents. God, I pray as they interact with these young people and other adults that are coming to Tijuana to build the homes, God, I pray that you would help them to be godly influences in their lives. Father, I pray as they're trying to learn and memorize even huge chunks of Scripture during the summer months and beyond, and as they are being challenged to make sacrifices for the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that you would grow their faith. Help, help their minds to be able to absorb the word of God. Father, I pray as they're driving around Tijuana, and uh, Father, the, you never know what can happen there, Lord. I just pray that you'll keep them safe in the vehicles that they're driving. God, I pray for their own spiritual health. Lord, we lift them up. We love them as a church. We've sent them out. And Father, we want to lift them up in prayer to you today and ask you to put your hedge of protection around them. God, you are a great God. You're a great God. And you, uh, you deserve to be worshiped and praised. We saw this first missionary journey trip leg today. And God, whenever we seek to advance the kingdom of God, there's always going to be opposition. We truly are in an all-out war with hell. But God, we know that hell is no match for you. 
We know that we have your presence with us, Lord Jesus. We have the person of the Spirit living inside us. And we have the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Make me bold, Lord Jesus. Make the people of this church bold for you. That this week even, in the boldness of, the, of, of your power and strength, that you would show us who you would have us to talk to about Jesus. And that we won't be afraid, even though there may be a bar Jesus on the scene. And God, while we may not be able to, to blind somebody, we don't need to. Because we have your gospel. We have you. Use us, I pray, this week that we may be faithful witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ.